Welcome. On behalf of Green at Google and authors at Google, it is my privilege to introduce Dr. Henry Pollack today. With his colleagues on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Dr. Pollack shared the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with former Vice President Al Gore. Dr. Pollack has been a professor of geophysics at the University of Michigan for more than 40 years and has conducted scientific research on all seven continents. He now serves as a science advisor to Al Gore's climate project. Dr. Pollack is here today to talk about his latest book, A World Without Ice. Following the talk, we'll have a Q&A session. And uh, please remember our remote audience at that time and use the microphone in the center aisle when you're asking a question. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Henry Pollack. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much to Google for the invitation to come and talk about my new book, A World Without Ice. I, I know there's a lot of excitement on the campus uh, at this very moment with the Secretary of Energy, Steve Chu, uh, announcing the uh, ARPA-E uh, new energy grants that are going to play a big role, we hope, in uh, mitigating uh, the effects of climate change. The introduction uh, by your president uh, just a few moments ago over in uh, the other auditorium uh, said that Steve Chu is, you know, someone who, you know, some guy with a Scandinavian accent called early in the morning one day, and that, of course, was the reference to the way in which people learn that they have won the Nobel Prize. Well, as you just heard in the introduction, that uh, uh, the 2007 Peace Prize was uh, shared between Al Gore, who, who had half of it, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, which I'm a, a member, I got the other half. So people said, did you get a, an early morning call from Oslo or Stockholm? And I said, no, uh, but I did get one from New York. And he said, what was that about? And I, I said, well, it was a kind of a, a faux Scandinavian accent. And it took me about maybe 10 seconds to recognize that it was my son calling. He had just heard about the IPCC winning the Nobel Prize on the radio, and he wanted to be the first to, uh, to let me know. So there he was in his best Norwegian accent. May I speak to Professor Polak and, and such. And uh, so that's how I uh, learned about the Nobel Peace Prize. And uh, I'm sure that Google has lots of Nobelists, but maybe not two in one day within an hour. And so uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me just say a little bit about myself, and then we'll get to talking about the book. Uh, I'm a, an earth scientist, a geologist, geophysicist, climate scientist. And, uh, and I teach at a university and do research in wonderful places around the globe. And uh, I found that uh, it, it's been a hard sell uh, persuading uh, the public that climate change is real and that humans are playing a big role in it. These these two facts, that climate change is real and humans are playing a big role, are very apparent to the scientific community. And, and yet, uh, there's about half of Americans who, who don't believe that it's happening and certainly don't think that people have anything to do with it. And so I've, uh, in addition to my scientific work, have tried to reach out and help people understand uh, the realities of climate change. And part of that work has been uh, working with Al Gore, who I understand is going to be here uh, in just a couple of weeks with his new book, which I had a chance to read in draft form uh, about a month ago. Uh, but I, I've been working with Al Gore in his climate project, which is a project that is designed to train community volunteers to go out into their, their hometowns and uh, talk at schools and uh, churches and rotary clubs, whatever audience they can pull together and talk about climate change. And uh, so I've been helping him in this training program of, uh, of bringing people to Nashville, that's Al Gore's hometown, 
and uh, in a long weekend of intense activity, uh, we send them back and they become climate messengers, as we call them. So, in that context, uh, I've also written this book called uh, A World Without Ice. And uh, the book is uh, about ice, climate, and people. Uh, the role that ice has played in the development of Earth's landscape, uh, in, the, in the development of Earth's climate, and in human civiliz its effects on human civilization, and the reciprocal impact that people are now having on ice. Uh, a theme interwoven throughout the, the book is uh, Earth's changing climate, uh, both in the past, uh, present, and in the future. Now, why ice? Why did I choose ice as a uh, vehicle to carry the story of, of uh, Earth's changing climate? There are three principal reasons that I like ice. Uh, the first is that ice plays a big role in Earth's climate system. Uh, the, in the polar regions where you have these big expanses of white ice, basically, uh, ice is a very good reflector. Snow is, too. If any of you have been skiing, you know you run the risk of getting sunburned, not from the sun coming from above, but from the reflection off of the snow from below will uh, give you a lot of uh, radiation. So ice is a very good reflector, and as a reflector, it uh, takes sunshine that would otherwise warm Earth and send it right back to space uh, without it doing any warming at all. And so uh, the more ice there is, the less sunshine Earth receives to warm it, and the, the less ice there is, the more Earth receives. And so uh, the coming and going of ice is a big piece of the global climate system. Secondly, ice uh, is a sensitive and unambiguous indicator of climate change. On Earth, ice is very close to its melting point and uh, a few degrees uh, warmer, and you get a substantial reduction in Earth's ice. And uh, likewise, if we were to uh, have it be a few degrees cooler, we would see an expansion of Earth's ice. But uh, changes in temperature uh, result in very visible uh, changes in the distribution of ice on Earth. And so uh, ice as a, a sensitive indicator uh, also is a, a good vehicle to tell the story of climate change. And ice is also neutral as an indicator. Uh, I, this is the only reading from the book I'll do for you. But it, in it I say that ice asks no questions, it presents no arguments, reads no newspapers, listens to no debates, it's not burdened by ideology, it carries no political baggage as it crosses the threshold from solid to liquid. It just melts. And that's uh, it, why it is such a good indicator, uh, and it leads to big changes in the uh, distribution of ice on Earth with very small changes in Earth's temperature. Now, the third uh, reason that I have chosen to tell this story uh, through ice is that uh, the consequences of Earth losing its ice uh, are very big. Uh, the, the first ice to go will be the glaciers uh, that sit on top of mountaintops in tropical and mid-latitude regions. And uh, they are melting back very, very fast. Uh, the ice on Kilimanjaro, which is very nearly on the equator, uh, will likely be gone in another decade. The ice uh, in the Andes, the equatorial Andes and temperate Andes, is shrinking fast. Uh, Glacier National Park uh, will probably not have its namesake glaciers in another two decades. Now, the importance of this meltback is that the the water that comes from melting mountain glaciers provides uh, the agricultural water and the domestic water, drinking and sanitation and the like, for about a third of Earth's population. It is a tremendous resource that, once it's gone, uh, if you think there are, are water problems, water shortages, and certainly you in California know about water shortages, 
you will you will see that same story all over the globe uh, in the parts of Asia that where the water supply comes from the high Himalaya uh, in the Andes where uh, much of Peru Chile Bolivia their their fruit uh, industry their flower industry much of that will uh, be greatly distressed and imperiled once the mountain ice is gone the other big consequence of, of melting ice is that eventually it leads to higher sea levels. Uh, when you turn ice into water, the water runs downhill, it eventually comes into the ocean, which alone will raise sea level, but as the oceans themselves are warming up as the climate change, they also thermally expand, and that is an additional source of sea level rise uh, coming from the warming uh, simply through the physics of, of expansion of water. And so those are the reasons that I've chosen ice as the vehicle for uh, this book. Now, it, I try and develop this, the story of ice on Earth uh, as a panorama through time, starting roughly at the peak of the last ice age about 20,000 years ago. Uh, at that time, Ice covered uh, all of Canada and North America uh, from the Canadian border down to about the Missouri River in the west and the Ohio River in the east. And in fact, those two rivers were actually uh, the result of carrying away all of the meltwater from the last ice age, and they defined the, the southern limit of, of the ice. Uh, in uh, Europe, uh, ice came uh, as far south uh, as about uh, the Midlands in the United Kingdom and uh, through Central Europe and the like and uh, had uh, gla mountain glaciers in, in the Alps. And uh, as a result, uh, there was an immense amount of ice, but ice and water are what I call playmates on a seesaw. And when you have a lot of H2O tied up in ice, you have much less of it tied up as water. And so when you have ice on the continents during an ice age, you also have much lower sea levels. And in fact, the, the ocean level at the height of the last ice age was about 400 feet lower than it is today. And it exposed large swaths of the continental shelves, which conveniently provided pathways for humans to migrate uh, from place to place uh, and from continent to continent. The Bering Land Bridge uh, was certainly an important one. Uh, the English Channel was dry, and so the communication between uh, the United Kingdom, not yet the United Kingdom, but that terrain, and, and continental Europe was uh, just a walk. And uh, throughout Southeast Asia, uh, there was a lot of dry land that facilitated uh, uh, human migrations. And so uh, the high ice volume, uh, low water level, uh, was a characteristic of the peak of the last ice age. Now, how about the people? At that time, there weren't many. Uh, the total population of the globe uh, about 20,000 years ago was perhaps on the order of one million people. One million people. Pick out your favorite city with one million population, but imagine that spread over the entire globe. That's the population density of uh, the peak of the last ice age. Well, now uh, we, we have a different situation. We've come out of the last ice age, and uh, we have seen uh, ice reduced on the globe. We, the main places for ice today are on the tops of very high mountains in the tropics and, and mid-latitudes, and in the big ice caps in Antarctica and in Greenland, and then in the frozen sea ice of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the ice on the Arctic Ocean is not very thick, it's just sea ice that has uh, frozen, uh, but uh, those are the main places where we have ice. So we have reduced ice, but we have a lot more people. Uh, from the one million people at the end of the last ice age, to about the year 1800, the growth of population went from 1 million to about 1 billion. 1800 was the year when Earth 
first uh, reached the, the threshold of uh, a billion population. So that took, let's say, almost 20,000 years. But the next billion, between 1800, the next billion came in 1930, 130 years later. And the next billion after that came in 1955. And the next billion after that came in 1974, when we reached four billion people. And today we're approaching seven billion and we'll reach eight billion by 2025 or so, and nine billion perhaps at mid-century, depending on which way the demography goes. That, that's a lot of people. Uh, if you were to take Earth's population today, and uh, close to seven billion people, and to try and grasp how many people uh, that really is, if, if someone were born every second and no one ever died, it would take more than 200 years to produce seven billion people. So it's an astounding rate of growth uh, that we've experienced in just the last uh, couple centuries. Not only, of course, do we have uh, a lot of people, but they're, they're a lot more clever than, than were the, the cave people and the people uh, living uh, on the fringes of the ice during the last ice age. The, the people today have learned to use energy. Uh, and I know that uh, in the other talk by Steve Chu, the, uh, the subject of energy usage, the subject of uh, carbon-based energy and the need to make the transition to, to non-carbon-based energy was under heated discussion when I left. But uh, so we have uh, not only a lot of people, but they all use a lot more energy. And the energy uh, lets them uh, make a big impact on the, uh, on the Earth as a whole. Uh, the landscape of the Earth uh, that uh, we, we have admired for a long time, uh, such as Yosemite Valley here in California, the Great Lakes in, in the Midwest, the Finger Lakes of New York, and other characteristics around the globe was all carved by ice during the last ice age. But today, humans are, are becoming a big rival for earth moving. Uh, currently, humans move more earth than rivers do. And we have a, a process of mining going on in the east today called mountaintop removal, where they simply blast the tops off of almost 500 peaks now or, or crests in the Appalachians and dump the debris into the around, surrounding valleys to be able to mine coal that's a few meters under the surface. So we're, humans have become rivals of nature and the ability to uh, move Earth. Uh, we have interfered with the hydrological system in dramatic ways. We have uh, dammed every major river in the USA. There's not an uncontrolled river that flows to the sea, uh, no longer. And we have uh, not only uh, uh, added all kinds of chemicals to the environment, but they are eventually making their way to the sea as well. Uh, currently, the use of agricultural fertilizers and uh, the chemicals that accumulate on the impervious surfaces of our cities and are washed into the sewer system by big storms, those make their way to the sea and are today causing dead zones in the, uh, in the sea where the major rivers uh, empty into the ocean. Uh, the coast off of Louisiana where the Mississippi uh, enters the sea has very substantial and extensive dead zones where effectively uh, nothing is living. We've had a big impact on our atmosphere. Uh, we have uh, you know, created smog that uh, drapes our cities and acid rain that uh, falls on our lakes and forests, uh, killing both the trees and the fish in the lakes. And we have uh, used uh, the synthetic chemicals, the chlorofluorocarbons, uh, put them to great use uh, but late, lately, or later discovered that they were destroying ozone over Antarctica. The creation of the Antarctic ozone holes directly linked to our use of synthetic chemicals. And uh, among other uh, things that we've been putting into the atmosphere are the greenhouse gases. 
Uh, carbon dioxide is a direct product of burning the carbon-based fuels, coal, petroleum, natural gas. And uh, the carbon dioxide, uh, for the most part, uh, is going into the atmosphere. Uh, some of it gets dissolved in the oceans, but the oceans can't take it up fast enough, and so the concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have been growing. We have known from studies of ice cores what the concentration range of carbon dioxide uh, has been in the past through ice ages and, and periods between ice ages. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has uh, uh, oscillated between about 200 and 300 parts per million. Uh, today, the concentration in the atmosphere is well out of that range of natural variability. We are at 390 parts per million and adding two or three parts per million uh, to the atmosphere every year under the, uh, our current industrial economy. And so humans are embarked on a vast uh, experiment, an inadvertent experiment with the chemistry of our atmosphere, and uh, the nature of that chemical experiment is also one that is an experiment with our climate. And because the uh, greenhouse gases trap heat trying to leave Earth, uh, the atmosphere warms, the surface warms, and it is that warming that is having its impact on the ice of the world. And so, what, what is happening to the ice? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, mountain glaciers everywhere are retreating, and uh, it's likely that most mountain glaciers in the world will be gone uh, be before uh, mid-century. We also see big changes in the sea ice of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, the Arctic Ocean, uh, I mentioned earlier, is just frozen seawater. Uh, that's the ice cap on it. Uh, it's on the order of uh, oh, 15 uh, feet thick in many places, a little thicker sometimes in other places. But every uh, summertime, there's a little bit of a breakup of the sea ice in the Antarctic until the last few decades when there's far more than a little bit. Uh, the area of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean in the summer has uh, been shrinking dramatically over the last few decades until uh, today about uh, only 60% of the area of summertime sea ice uh, that formerly existed uh, is present today and its thickness has been reduced by about half. The net result of that is that the Arctic Ocean is much more open, and the sunshine that might have been reflected away by the white sea ice is now being absorbed by the dark seawater and warming the Arctic Ocean. What that does is it prevents the freezing in the fall, uh, it pushes it back a few months into later into the fall, and uh, it also uh, leads to earlier breakup. So we're on, on a pathway, I think, to see an ice-free Arctic Ocean in the summertime uh, in just a few decades. And that will be a whole new regime change in the Arctic. Uh, there will be commercial interests that will move in very quickly searching for uh, resources. There will be fishery, uh, fishery ships coming in and scooping up uh, the Arctic fisheries resource. Uh, there will be trade uh, routes open up the, the fabled Northwest Passage and the Northeast Passage will become reality uh, and uh, lead to much more uh, sea traffic in the Arctic Ocean. And so, big changes just due to the loss of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean. Then, of course, uh, comes the rise of sea level. Sea level rise is not something of the future. It's already happening. Sea level has risen about eight inches in the 20th century, and the projections of the IPCC, uh, and I'll come back to how conservative they are in a minute, uh, the IPCC said that uh, you can expect uh, another two feet of sea level rise in the 21st century. Now, that is far and away a lower bound in my mind, uh, because we're learning a lot of things about uh, how rapidly ice is leaving Greenland and Antarctica and plopping into the ocean. 
the IPCC calculation of what we could expect in sea level was basically a melting calculation, uh, how fast Greenland would melt, how fast Antarctica would melt, and that water would eventually make its way to the sea. But you don't need to wait for ice to melt to raise sea level. If you drop an ice cube into a beverage glass, uh, you'll see that the sea or the level in the beverage glass rises right away. And we're now witnessing wholesale loss of ice from both Greenland and West Antarctica. Uh, Greenland has the equivalent of about 20 feet of sea level rise uh, with its ice, and West Antarctica the same. East Antarctica is a, uh, a much bigger pile of ice and it stands much higher and it's going to take a lot more to destabilize that. But Greenland and West Antarctica are already uh, losing their ice at faster rates than the IPCC <clears throat> had predicted. Now the IPCC understood why uh, uh, its uh, projections were on the low side because already uh, the rapid uh, acceleration of ice off of Greenland was, was visible, and the same in West Antarctica. And the reason being that there was a, uh, a lot of summertime melting of the top of the ice sheet, and the water was finding its way down through fissures to the base of the ice sheet and lubricating the base of the ice sheet and it was slipping off much faster than simply uh, a melting from the top. In the Antarctic, uh, some of the big ice shelves that are simply glacial ice that spilled off the continents onto the sea, uh, <clears throat> they too are becoming de unstable because the seawater is warming and uh, eroding them from below and thinning them and breaking them up. And so my guess is that uh, we're more likely to see something on the order of three to six feet of sea level change in the 21st century. Now, what would, what would that mean? What would three feet of sea level change mean? Uh, well, it means that you would lose about the, uh, the southern 20% of Florida. It would be reclaimed by the sea. All of the Florida Keys would be gone. Uh, much of the the, the gentle Atlantic seacoast of the Carolinas and Georgia would see big incursions of the sea. But the, the human tragedy is big. Uh, if you look at how many people live within three feet of sea level the world over, you'll discover that it, it numbers about 100 million. And we, we experience the social problems of dealing with dislocated people with the people in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. We had about 150,000 people that were uh, climate refugees. The number of people affected by three foot rise in sea level is about 100 million people worldwide. And that's a, a social challenge, uh, an international challenge of the first order. And it's, it gives urgency to all of the things that uh, Secretary Chu was talking about uh, in the other auditorium uh, just a, a few moments ago. Uh, we have, some people say that the, we should not let the concentration of greenhouse gases reach uh, uh, beyond 450 parts per million, that really bad things start to happen then. Uh, currently we're at 390 and increasing at around three parts per million every year. Well, you can do the arithmetic. I know people at Google are good at doing arithmetic. Uh, there's 60 parts per million to work with, and if we're adding three parts every year, that gives us about two decades to, to stabilize uh, our emissions of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And that may sound like a long time, but two decades to totally uh, reinvent uh, energy uh, usage, energy supply uh, around the world is a big challenge. Now, I'm, I was listening to Secretary Chu, and he was asked the question, well, are you optimistic? <laughs> and in some ways, I am optimistic, uh, because I, I know that once you get people's attention, in serious ways that they can respond uh, very you know uh, impressively 
Uh, I'm old enough to remember World War II when uh, the U.S. was suddenly uh, hit over the head with a two by four. That was uh, <clears throat> our entry into World War II. And all domestic uh, industry was ended and converted to uh, a wartime industry. Uh, no more uh, passenger automobiles, no more refrigerators, no more uh, appliances. Uh, every bit of industry was turning to build airplanes, tanks, uh, vehicles, artillery. And in just one year, the, the uh, transformation was so dramatic that one aircraft factory near my hometown in Michigan, one aircraft factory was making more airplanes than all of Japan. And that was a, a transformation of dramatic proportions, but it took something to get our attention. I think that uh, we need to uh, pay attention now. That's one of the reasons that I, I wrote the book. And it's one of the reasons that I try and talk in various venues uh, around the country, even around the world for that matter, uh, to make people very aware that uh, we don't have a lot of time to dilly-dally and that there's a real sense of urgency in, uh, in making the transformation to non-carbon-based energy. If we do that, uh, we'll still be able to retain our ice. Uh, if we don't do that, then you're going to get what I have as the title of my book, A World Without Ice. With that, I'm going to uh, stop talking, and I'd love to have some discussion with you and to hear your thoughts and, and your questions, and uh, let's, let's have a good uh, chat. Thank you very much. What's the custom uh, here at Google? Does anyone just stand up and go to the mic or whatever? All right, we have a volunteer. So I think one difficulty that we face on this issue is basically communicating sort of what exactly the sort of global threat that we're um, envisioning if we get to 450 parts per million to the general population? Because um, it, it seems kind of abstract. Well, well, it does. Uh, and the reason that <clears throat> ice may not be a perfect medium is that the ice is a long way away from where the people are. But the sea level change affects the entire globe. And so the, the task is to uh, have people be aware that what seems to be an issue, a remote issue, uh, in fact, is one that has very direct consequences. And uh, just to follow up, so it sounds like, um, based on what you're saying, that kind of the direction that we're headed is maybe losing lots of ice, whether we get to 450 or not. Or maybe that's only if we get to 450, then that's going to start happening. Um, no, we're, it's already happening. Uh, we don't want it to go beyond that threshold. Some actually think uh, 350 is the proper threshold. We're already past that, and they want to return as quickly as possible. Bill McKibben is one uh, who advocates that. Uh, but uh, the, I think that the answer, the real question you're asking, is uh, we have to translate this into issues that are closer to home that people do understand. And in that context, I think that the global financial crisis is a, a stroke of luck. I, I'm sorry that it, you know, for all the people who are out of work, that's uh, no stroke of luck at all. But uh, it is kind of the whack in the head that I, I speak of where people say, gee, everything we've been doing suddenly doesn't, it doesn't seem like we really knew what we were doing. So maybe we can take bold steps now. And Al Gore said uh, something like, you know, our dependence on foreign oil and the security issues associated with that, our status as the, as the world's largest debtor nation, our financial instability around the world, and climate change are not four separate problems. They're all four facets of the same problem, a misguided national energy policy. 
So I, I admire uh, the way that uh, Steve Chu and his colleagues in Washington are focusing on energy. Uh, if we get our energy policy right, that's something everyone understands locally. They don't have to think about polar ice uh, to get the message. So having that now as a vehicle uh, to get people's awareness and their creativity thinking uh, going, I think is a, a, a good step. Hi, thank Hi. you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, so if you see that a lot of these things are, are already happening and you can see the change, and um, my first question is, how do you still sleep at night <laughs> if you know that this is all coming? Well, that's a good question, because uh, I'm, I'm as concerned as, as any. Uh, and I, I don't lose sleep over it, but I do think about it and try and think of you know, what can I do differently to reach more people to, to develop an awareness? And uh, so, while I, as I say, I'm not losing sleep, it has energized me during the day uh, to explore as many avenues as possible. And one of them, I should say, is that people say, well, what can I do individually to, do, to help uh, mitigate climate change? And of course, you, you've heard all of it. Uh, you know, we want to have our uh, houses more energy efficient. We want to have our transportation more energy efficient. Uh, we want to change light bulbs. We want to drive less. We uh, want to choose where we live so we don't have to commute so much. And all of those are important personal decisions. And, and I'm even, I've even become aware that even rethinking your eating habits uh, is something that can have a big impact because of, there. of course, there are so many of us, and choices of, among foods have very real energy uh, implications. Uh, but I, I still think that the problem is so big that it's, it won't come from volunteerism or individual choice. Uh, we need a, both state and national policies and international policies that come from our elected representatives. And so your vote is very important. If the people that go to Congress that represent you aren't representing you in this issue, you should let them know that and let them know that if there's another election in 18 months or whenever, and if they don't establish a, a track record, uh, you know, we're going to work hard to move you out. So votes are important, and communicating your impatience with your, your uh, elected representatives is important. They do understand that they have to get reelected, and uh, if you cast it just that starkly, uh, that, that plays a big role. We're not going to do it individually. We're going to do it through national and international uh, policy and leverage. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could, I know this is a complex subject, but, but try and explain the, the cooling and warming model a little bit. Because to, to me, who's, who's sort of untrained in this, um, you know, ice and carbon seem like two different things. And if, if we factor out people, you know, you talked about reflectivity. And that, that completely makes sense. I can see that. But if, if I, like, okay, if I apply that to the past ice age, it would seem like, oh, we'd never warm up again because as the yeah. ice got thicker and thicker, we'd get more and more reflective, and, and then there would be yeah. nothing to tip the balance back. And so well, there must be something. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could kind of unify that model. Well, I, it's, not, it's not my unification. It has been, of course, studied intensively. And, in fact, ice ages do end, and they're followed by rapid warming. But part of the end of ice ages has to do with orbital factors uh, in the Earth and its orbit about the sun, and uh, that uh, the tilt of the Earth's axis, which is today about 23 and a half degrees from the plane of our orbit about the sun, uh, that actually oscillates between 21 and 24 degrees. And the shape of the ellipse about the sun uh, oscillates with a period of about 100,000 years. And the, uh, the precession of the equinoxes, which determines which hemisphere uh, is getting uh, more sunshine in June uh, or December, uh, that has a period in the, in the low 20,000 years. And those factors are the, the big pacemakers of the Ice Age. But what we've noticed is that throughout the ice ages, 
temperature and carbon dioxide have marched together. Now, the lesson of that is that the two are strongly coupled, that the, uh, the temperature and the carbon cycle are, are tied together. And whenever either one gets out in the lead, it pulls the other along. So if the temperature weren't to warm, it would pull the carbon dioxide up. If the carbon dioxide is added quite independently of temperature, it'll pull the temperature up. In the current world, we are pulling carbon dioxide way out ahead of temperature, and the temperature is starting to catch up. And so, yes, there are the long period uh, orbital factors that play a role, but uh, right now, we are pulling carbon out of the Earth and sending it back to the atmosphere at a pace that it hasn't seen for over a million years, probably many million years. Yeah. So I can imagine how we can adapt to uh, rising sea levels and missing ice. I'm more concerned about ocean acidification. Um, I wonder uh, if you have any uh, insight or words to add about how dramatically the ecology of the oceans will shift as the pH drops. Well, there's quite a, a well-established uh, observational data about the, the slow decline in the pH. And the, the, the oceans are, are still not acidic in the in the technical sense but they're approaching uh, they're becoming less alkaline and approaching acidity and that of course does affect any of the organisms that uh, uh, use calcification as uh, the way of building their shells or, or their reefs or whatever uh, we're just beginning to see studies that show that coral reefs are having trouble uh, some of the, the bivalves on the ocean floor, are uh, their shells are thinning. And so uh, it's at a stage now where you're getting all the early warning signs. Uh, but uh, just as we need to stabilize our emissions into the atmosphere, after all, that is what is driving the uh, increase in or the decrease in pH in the oceans, is that the oceans are being asked to absorb more and more of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And they do that, but it's uh, changing the pH. Uh, where it's going to take us uh, is not so clear to me. I'm, I'm not a biologist and I don't have that insight. But it's, uh, it's a very real problem because the, the marine environment, of course, is a, a huge source of, of human nourishment. And uh, to, to see that uh, you know, be impacted in this way is ominous. Now, I might add that there are schemes afoot to, to block sunshine. Uh, it's called geoengineering or climate engineering by uh, putting artificial pollution into the atmosphere to reflect sunshine away or to uh, spray water vapor into the atmosphere to promote cloud formation. Uh, all of that is to kind of mechanically interfere with sunshine reaching the Earth. But that doesn't do anything uh, for the problem you, you cited. Uh, if we're still pumping out carbon dioxide uh, and trying to adjust climate by reducing sunshine, the carbon dioxide is still going to go into the ocean and lead to a drop in pH. So I'm, I, I think that the, the geoengineering or the climate engineering solutions are short-sighted if they focus only on uh, blocking of sunshine. Yes. Um, apologies if you covered this earlier in your talk, but methane uh, is one of the other large contributors to effects in the atmosphere, and uh, we have a you know billions of tons of biomass in the Arctic that's thawing out and uh, letting methane out. Uh, it seems to me that could have a pretty disastrous impact uh, on the behavior of the atmosphere. And I was wondering um, what it, your comments were. The 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 comment that uh, as the regions around the Arctic are, are thawing out, the permafrost is degrading, and that there is a lot of methane locked in the, uh, the permafrost that's making its way to the atmosphere. Uh, and that's all true. And, and there is also methane stored in ice uh, just below the ocean floor, uh, which has a huge amount of methane that if it were destabilized and went into the atmosphere, that it too would add to the greenhouse gas burden of the atmosphere. About the melting of the permafrost, uh, once again, uh, kind of the first stage of measurements in uh, the permafrost lakes that are developing uh, show, yes, indeed, there is a methane flux. Uh, and uh, how, 
How fast that will penetrate, the melting will penetrate and release more is the, the big question. Most calculations of the diffusion of heat downward to melt the permafrost and release the methane shows that it's, a, it's, it's not a fast problem. It's, it's one that is, would progress slowly and uh, have a time scale that would be in the, the centuries rather than an immediate uh, belching out of large amounts of methane. So while it's nothing to, to you know, say, there's nothing to trivialize, uh, but it is, uh, it's not something that's going to overwhelm us uh, uh, with a very fast and uh, furious feedback into the greenhouse. Okay, I, I was, I guess, looking more at the uh, the Arctic uh, climate in Siberia as opposed to the one in, say, northern Canada, because the the biospheres there were tremendously different. Yep. Well, the the area that's been studied, at least that I'm familiar with, is in fact the uh, Siberian permafrost. That's where these early measurements that I was describing uh, first were made. I, I'm sure the Canadians are active too, but as uh, you pointed out, maybe it's quite a different biosphere. So I, I, I can't offer a lot of insight into that other than to say that I think that the physics of the destabilization is fairly slow. Yes. Hi. Um, I think it's great that uh, there is more consciousness around you know, our problems and people are changing habits and there is progress being made. But I still worry very much about the rate of that kind of progress when you talk about you know, the hundreds of millions and billions of people being added to the earth, when you talk about we're only 60 parts per million away from a pretty nasty threshold and, and we're, we're, we're rising quickly. You talked about how quickly the, in your, in your point on being optimistic, you saw what happened in your town with a conversion to military industrial capability. Where's the Pearl Harbor though that's gonna help us out this time? Where, where is the Pearl Harbor? Where is the, uh, the two by four that, that gives us the whack? Uh, I, I can envision two by fours. Uh, I can envision, for instance, a, uh, a large uh, dislodgement of ice from Greenland that would raise sea level, you know, maybe three or four inches at one time. Uh, that could happen. And three or four inches is, is a lot. Uh, when you think of uh, what it means in increasing the, uh, the, the strength of any storm that strikes the seashore, uh, the storm surges are bigger, the tides are bigger, uh, everything about it uh, suddenly is augmented by this uh, half foot of sea level rise. That maybe would get attention. Um, it's hard to know what kind of a, an earthquake that it would take to say, wow, this is, you know, we really have to do something about it. And part, part of that, I think, has to do with uh, people, people don't consider themselves strong in the face of nature. That they are wowed by earthquakes, that they've seen their, uh, you know, actions before. And that they... Uh, they say, woe is me, you know, a hurricane or a tsunami or an earthquake, uh, you know, who am I in the face of the powers of nature? But what they don't realize is that collectively, all, almost seven billion of us are now the most powerful geological force on the planet. And it's that awareness that has to shift. And uh, it's, that's a tough one because it's a, a cognitive problem, it's a sociological problem. Um, it's not quite the same as uh, a surprise attack. No. So I wanted to thank you for coming to Google today. And for those of you who got books, he'll be signing books over there yeah. after this. So thank you for coming. Thank you. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah.